Okay, Be'ezat Hashem, Naseh V'Natzliach. We'll try one more time. We'll start off with Elul and then we'll just connect everything after. So, we've said that the month of Elul is the acronym of Anil Dodi Vedodili. And if you take the last letter of Anil, uh, of Anil Dodi Vedodili, it's the letter Yud. And the Yud has a numerical value of 40. And basically, these are 40 days that we have the, the, the month of Elul plus the Aset Yemet Teshuvah. And these are days of mercy, days that are, uh, that are slated, that are marked for Teshuvah, for repentance. It's an auspicious time to get closer to Kadosh Baruch Hu, so much that Kadosh Baruch Hu brings himself down. And we start the season of Amelech Basadab, King is in the field. Also, we were in the middle of, uh, of sharing this and we got cut off, but this is where we left off. If you take 40 days and you multiply the hours in every day, every day has 24 hours. So if you take 40 days times 24 hours, there's 960 hours in the Teshuvah season. Why is this interesting? Because the same, that's the same numbers that it takes to, uh, to create a kosher mikveh. You know a mikveh that you dip in order to become, you know, to purify yourself. If you look at the, the, the configuration of a mikveh, it, its requirements is that it needs 40 se'ah. What is a se'ah? Se'ah is 24 login. And so if you take the 24 login, which is a measurement in the day they use in the Gemara, that constitutes one se'ah, it actually comes to the exact same number, that a mikveh has 960 login, equivalent to the 960 hours that we have in the Teshuvah season and Lun. What does this signify to us? What does it hint to us? That the 40 days that we have in Elul, plus the 10 days of Aseti Metshuva are like a mikveh that purifies us from all of our sins. Just like the formula for a mikveh is 960 cubits of water, whatever that is. Similarly, the 960 hours that are in the Teshuva season serves as a mikveh for us to purify us, to, uh, to uh, sanctify us from our sins and our transgression. So we come to Barashat Kitetzeh, it's very interesting because the first few pesukim, I'll uh, I'll read, translate, and then we'll go back into it. It says, "Ki tetzel amilchama," when you go out to war, aloyvecha against your enemies, untano Hashem lokecha beadecha, and Hashem puts your, the enemy in your hand, veshavita shivio, and you will capture his captivity. Veraita b'shivia eshati fatoa, and in captivity, and you're going to see a woman who's beautiful. And you desired her. You took, it, you took her for yourself as a wife. And you brought this woman from the war zone to your home. And she shaves her hair. She lets her hair, grow, her nails grow out. And she took away her beautiful dress that she was wearing. And she sat in the center of your living room and she sat there and she cried because she no longer is going to be able to see her father and her mother. And then after this process, you can actually consummate the marriage and have her as your wife. And if you don't want her, and you want to send her away, you don't have the option of selling her. You're not going to en enslave her and you're not going to afflict her. So, it's good, to, you know what, let me go f a few more Pesukim, even though that it's not so much uh, relevant to what we're learning tonight, but it just it, it, it just goes hand in hand. And if you learn Parashat Ki say it's good to know the first section. It says, Not the guy's in a, in a weird predicament. He's got his wife and the girl that he brought from the war zone. And now he has a, a situation where there's two, two wives in his home. One is beloved and one is hated. And both the beloved and the hated wife uh, bear children for him. And uh, the firstborn 
meaning the firstborn for him as a man, came out of the woman that he hated. And the day comes when he wants to inherit his children, his inheritance. He can't skip over the firstborn from the hated wife and give it to the children from the beloved wife. Because he must give the Bechor of the hated wife double portion of the inheritance for all the Bechor Hashem said, for all that he has uh, that belongs to him. Because he's the because he's the firstborn from his, uh, um, his, his, his initial vigor, meaning he's his firstborn out of all his uh, relationships. He gets the right for the firstborn rights. So it's very interesting, this little predicament that a guy go, gets into when he goes to war. We're going to zoom in to just the first Kipesukim, because believe it or not, we're also in a war. When it says, Ki when you go to war on your enemy, so what is the war that we all... First of all, what is, who is our enemy? Who is our number one? That's very good, but the, the more, more right, the right, the evil inclination, he's our enemy. And when you go to war against your Yetzirah, against your evil, your evil inclination, when do we go to war against the evil inclination? Very simple, in Elul, right now, the next 40 days, we're going to war. Why? Because this is it. Everything is on the line. Our entire lives are on the line. Whether we get to live or die the, the following year, whether we're going to be healthy or sick, rich, poor, happy, sad, married, single, kids, no kids, everything. Whether you're going to move up in life or you're going to go back in life. All the things are on the line. So we're at war. The Teshuvah season gave us the opportunity to atone for our sins. As we learned, the, 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 the month of Elul, we're giving... We have the ability to atone for all 12 months in the month of Elul. So obviously there's going to be one individual who's against us cleaning up our, our, our spiritual debt to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Who's that? The evil inclination. So it's war. We're going to war. The next 40 days, he's going to try to do anything and everything to stop us from succeeding in the Teshuvah season. So when it says, Ki milchama When you go to war, the evil inclination, who's your enemy, when? In the month of Elul. The next part of the Pasuk is unbelievable. Hashem will put him in your hand. You will be victorious. Why would that be? Why would it be that you are going to be victorious? Because what does Hashem want you to do? Just fight. Just show up. Make an effort. Go to war. Who wins the war? Hashem wins the war for you. Hashem is the one that fights your wars for you. But you have to go to war. You have to physically show up. You have to mentally show up. You can't expect Hashem to you know, wipe out all your spiritual debt if you're not doing any work towards it. You have to make a genuine hishtadlut, a genuine effort, and Hashem will put him into your hands, you'll be victorious. When you go to war against your evil inclination in the month of Elul, during the Teshuvah season, when you can liquidate, atone for all your sins, Hashem will put him in your hand. The evil inclination will lose. The following pasuk is very in interesting. He says that you're going to go, and in the time of, uh, when, when you go to war, there's going to be a, things that you capture and one of the things that you're going to see at war is you're going to see something that you like a lot you're going to see an eshet yefatoa a beautiful woman let's tie it back to the teshuvah season you're going to war uh, going to war against yetzara what is this beautiful woman that you're going to see during the month of Elul no the month of Elul what is the zodiac sign for Elul what's the zodiac sign Virgo 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 is the virgin, the Ishat Yefetor, the beautiful maiden. So you're going to look and say, wow, what a beautiful month. This is the month where I'm able to atone for all my sins. I'm going to war and I see something beautiful at war, the month of Elul. As we said, let's let me just give a little bit of a refresher of what that means. 
in Masechet Kiddushin it says that a, a woman that gets married, she gets up to tw- a, a young maiden, a young woman that's about to get married, they give her 12 months to get her affairs in order. Get a caterer, a dress, hire a DJ, fire a DJ, you know, all the things that people go through when they're doing weddings, right? Flowers, no flowers. However, they give her 12 months. But by the way of Remez, in, in regards to the Teshuvah season, we give to the month of Virgo, the, the, the month that is connected to Teshuvah, the ability to atone for all 12 months, meaning whatever you send on Tishrei, Cheshvan, Kisred, Teve, all that, whichever month you want to go back into, you can go back, do spiritual audit of all your sins and go back and do a Teshuvah on it, it wipes it out. One month that has the power to wipe out all 12 months worth of sins. So when I go to war, I see something beautiful. What's beautiful? The month of Elul. What a beautiful month. The month of Virgo. The month is beautiful. Like the, like the woman is beautiful. Like Say it again? The woman is beautiful like before you shave her head. And then the month doesn't have her. So the reason why she's beautiful is because in the beginning, he sees something beautiful in the woman. The second part of shaving her head is in order to thwart him away. To make him not want to be here. We, we sort of like want to say, hey, you gave into your impulses, you know, stop right there. You don't have to go all the way with it. And they actually put him in a process. Can you may imagine in the middle of your living room, you got a woman with shaved head. She took away her pretty dress that she put on during the war to seduce the guy. And now she's there with her ugly nails, shaved head, ugly dress. And the guy still wants to go with it. And maybe it's a real thing. Maybe he saw something beautiful over there. Now keep in mind, when the Jews went to war, these are not like uh, barbarians. These were 12,000 tzaddikim. These were righteous individuals. They had, these were people that were holy. They didn't even have a sin in their record because if they had a sin, they'd have fear. And if they had fear, that's to stay behind. So that means even if they saw an Isha'iyah Petrov, in reality, they saw some, some sort of a spiritual spark in her that was special. Not so much the physical part that we're learning on a shot level. Nevertheless, since we're talking about the Teshuvah season, the Virgo is the beautiful wo- uh, woman in the, in the Teshuvah season. The month is something beautiful. Why? Because it has the capabilities to atone for all of our sins in one, in one month. So how does a month turn ugly? Say it again? So then how does a month turn ugly? So there's Isha. So I'm going to answer you, uh, your questions at the end. But just to explain to you what's Isha, Snua, Ishna, Isha Uva, an ugly, uh, I'm sorry, a hated wife and a beloved wife. What is it? Hated wife is what is all the sins that she did the entire year. The the lo- the, the beloved wife is what is the the wife after the teshuvah. In other words, it's the same. It could even be said that you know that it's the before and after the teshuvah season. Before she's hated, all this all the sins are there. After the teshuvah season, she's what she's beloved. Furthermore, the Zohar gives us another insight in regards to this. 40 day process. The Megalea Mukot says The Megalea Mukot says by the way of the Zohar something incredible. It says that Yaakov Avinu took a share of the year and the months that are included in those in the share of the year are Nisan, Iyar, and Sivan. The months of Nisan, Iyar, and Sivan belong to Yaakov. Esav took three other months from the year that belong to him, which are Tammuz, Av, and Elul. Esav was extremely happy because he received the month in Elul in his share. And why is he happy? Because as long as Esav has some sort of a hold on the month of Elul, he's able to prevent the Jewish people from doing a proper teshuvah process. And they are not able to rectify what the entire year with the power that's embedded in this month. So Esav was very happy. The best month of the year for, for, for the Jews to atone for the sins of the entire year is in my hands. Yaakov Avinu did not like that, and he went to war with Esav. 
and he actually took the month of Elul from him in order for his, his children to be able to have the Teshuvah process that's available to them prior to Judgment Day, which is Rosh Hashanah, and that special time period called Aser Timet Teshuvah up until Yom Kippur. And by the way, how did Yaakov take from Esau? It's the famous fight when it says that the son of Esau, when, when Yaakov was wrestling with the angel, who was the angel? Esau's angel is the angel of death, the devil himself, the Samit Mem, the Yetzara, the Grim Reaper. It was him. They got into a fight the entire time that they were there, and they were fighting and fighting, and the Zohar reveals to us, what were they fighting about? Yaakov says, give me back Elul. I need Elul for my children. Furthermore, if you understand the secret that the Zohar revealed to us, now I can go back into Bereshit and read you the Pesukim. Because remember when Yaakov and Esau finally made peace? How did it happen? Well, uh, I'll just give you a, a quick refresher. Yaakov says, I got to leave my, my, my terrible and evil uh, father-in-law. Cheats me left and right. Doesn't pay me correctly. I'm not, I'm not moving forward over here. I got 11 kids over here working on 12. I got to go. I got to make a living for myself. I got to separate myself from this evil man called Lavan. On his way leaving, he knew that his twin brother wanted to murder him. Because that's the reason why he ran away to Lavan. The reason why he went there is because Esau wanted to murder him. Now that he's going back from Lavan, he says, you know, my brother's still waiting for me. Let me send him some gifts. Let me send him some uh, messengers. Let them know that I'm coming and I'm coming to make peace. All the way there, Yaakov forgot a small little, they say like a jug or some sort of a vessel, something small. But Sadiqim, when they receive something from God, even, even something small means a lot to them. Because they're not thieves. These are something that they earned from a Kadosh Baruch Hu. Even if it's a $99 item, it's from a Kadosh Baruch Hu. He went back to it. When he came back, who's right there to face him? The Samit Mem, the angel of death, is right there. And they fought all night. They fought all night. And at the end, Yaakov won. He got injured. He got hit on his leg. Nevertheless, he won that battle. And part of the winnings of that war was that he extracted the month of Elul out of the hands of Esav, and now it belongs to us. When he finally meets Esav, they have a conversation. Remember Esav came, and he gave him a hug, and he gave him a kiss. The Midrash says that he came to do what? To bite him, right? He wanted to actually kill him. Nevertheless, it says that they wanted to make peace, and he said the following words. But now that we know what happened behind the scenes, look at the beautiful, beautiful explanation that we have. It says, Yaakov Avinu, after he made peace with Esav, and he gave him all the gifts, what did Esav tell him? What was the conversation? What was the dialogue? He says, Rashi explains over there, he told him, let's travel together, because we are equal now. Right? We're brothers, we're twins, we made peace, we're equal. In, that, in other words, he tells him, we are even, shave shave. He says, you took three months, shlosha chodashim, velecherki gam ken shlosha chodashim. He says, now that we made peace, tachzir li et chodash elul shalakachta mimeni. I am no longer a threat to you. You know that fight that my angel lost to you? I want that month back. Let's be equal. Nes'a venelcha velcha lenegdecha. Let's go and I'll walk and I'll travel with you and we'll be equals. He's, he's telling him, give me back Elul. Yaakov answers him and he tells him, Vayomer elav, Adoni, yodea ke eladim rachim, v'atzon v'abakar alot alai. He says, so he tells them, my master, uh, you know, giving him words of, uh, of honor, you know that the children are soft and that the animals and the livestock are my responsibility. But what he's really letting him know, that the, 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 the flock and uh, is actually, who's the flock? Is the Jewish people, which is his children. That the progeny of all the Jewish people are going to come from him. The flock of Ami Said is going to come through him. And he says that I have to protect them because they're so, they're, 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 they're vulnerable. And he says, 
And he says, and if something happens to them in one day, meaning if they need to do their Teshuvah process just one day a year, which is Yom Kippurim, the Day of Atonement, and if I leave them with the option, if I give you back Elul, and I give you, and I leave you with the option I'm sorry, and I leave my children with the option of only one day of atonement, which is the day of atonement, Yom Kippurim, v'matu kol atzon, all the flock will die. Why? Because they cannot rectify in one day what they damaged the entire year. Lachen atzatihi, what my advice back to you is, and Yaakov answers back and he says, avor na adoni lefana lifne avdo. He tells him what? He says, why don't you go before me, which is what? Take the two months that are Tammuz and Av, that they are before the month of Elul. And he continues to say, And I will go slowly, slowly in my pace. I can't go on the same pace as you. I have a vulnerable flock of sheep and my family. Interestingly, interestingly enough, when he says, Va'ani et nahela, he says, I got to take my time slowly in the Teshuvah process of Elul. I can't go fast with you. I can't rely on one day. I can't, I can't have one day to atone for all the sins. I need the month of Elul. I can't give it back to you. Continues to say, and he says, I need to start my Teshuvah season from Chodesh Elul. Meaning, I have all this work that I have to do, me and my children, to rectify through the process of Teshuvah. He says, uh, uh, and then when I'm done with this process, again, you know, the pshat, the simple interpretation, you think he's talking about his flock, and he's just protecting the flock because they can't travel fast, and he has to take care of his young children, and all that, but, you know, in between the lines, he's actually talking about Am Yisrael, the month of Elul, and how he has to protect them, and he has to protect the, the ability to rectify for this in the month of Elul as, alone, as opposed to just one day. And then he gives him a, a, an incredible uh, punchline. Ad asher vo el Adoni Seira. And then I'll catch up to you and I'll go to where you're dwelling, this place called Seir. Rashi says, he says, Yaakov here was talking about the future. He was talking about the Messianic era. Meaning what? What was he talking about? He says, he says, I'm going to keep the month of Elul up until the time I come to the mountain of Seir. And we have in the prophets in Ovadia it says, He says, you know when Yaakov is finally going to reach Esav's Har Seir, when Mashiach comes and he's going to take the Samich Mem and he's going to shift him right on the mountain and it's the Messiah, and then Mashiach is here. So when he told him, I'll meet you on your mountain, it's like thousands of years later when Mashiach is coming. All this is happening behind the scenes. So this month of Elul is, is a gift. It's a, it's a gift that Yaakov went to war for. And that's why the Yetzirah, every single time Elul comes around, you know what he says, this is not business, this is personal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. I, I, you know, I got, uh, I got uh, maneuvered out of this month by Yaakov Avinu, but I know that these are his children, and he makes it very, very difficult for us during this month to come back to Teshuvah. All of a sudden, you don't have the desire, all of a sudden you're not connected to tefillah. All of a sudden you don't feel like doing chesed. All of a sudden you're watching TV more than ever before. You're on your phone more than ever before. All of a sudden there's all these emails and all these phone calls. And you're super busy at work but you're not making money. For some reason it's like a lot of work but it's not moving anywhere. And like what's going on? And it's uh, is working on overtime. The month of Elul just don't do teshuvah. Now now that, now that you know that tactic you have to understand okay you know. I got it. That's what's coming. It's like you already know what's uh, what's coming up. So once you know what's coming up, you, what you have to do is you have to prepare yourself. What do you do? You do your effort for work. You don't stop working. God forbid. You gotta go do. You gotta make. You gotta. Uh, you know the finances the mishpacha. You gotta provide livelihood for your for your family. But 
you got to be on the lookout, you know, for those smoky uh, screens that he puts in front of you. What's legit, what's not. And then when you catch yourself too much on the phone or too much on the... Ah, I could be doing Teshuvah. I got 12 months of atonement. Did I make my list yet? Did I make my plus and minus? Do I know what I'm asking forgiveness for? Have I done my Tafshin Pei Gimel pros and cons? Mitzvot and Averot? That I'm going to do my, uh, um, my atonement on? So you have to be careful. You have to be very, very careful. Furthermore, the fight for Elul and our work to get it back from Esav and Yetzirah is actually still on. Why? Because the Bnei Saschar says something incredible. There's a Pasuk in Tehillim, it says, Aromimcha Hashem kidilitani velo simachta oivayli. It says that we exalt Hashem because He, well, I'm, gonna, I'm, going, to, I'm going to translate it the way the Bnei Saschar is, translated, is translating it. He says, I'm going to exalt God ki dilitani. What's dilitani? Dilitani comes from the word delet. Many times we interpret it under dalut, to be poor. But this time we're going to uh, interpret it as dilitani. Thank you, Hashem, that you opened up a door for me. Which door? The door of Teshuvah. When? In the month of Elul. Velo simach You didn't make my enemy happy. Who is our enemy? That Pasuk in Tehillim, the Bnei Saschar says, Thank you, Hashem, that you opened up a door for me, the month of Elul, the month of Teshuvah, and that you didn't make the Yetzirah happy by what? By giving him Elul. Now, we know that Sarosh and Esav fought with Yaakov in order to take the month of Elul, and even in the wording of the fight, it says over there, if you remember, Vayar kelo yechol lo. It says that the angel saw that he's, he doesn't have the ability to beat Yaakov in this fight. So if you take the word lo, which is no, right? It's lamed and aleph. Yechol lo, he wasn't able to beat him. Lo is him, right? Is lamed vav. If you put them together, lamed aleph and lamed vav, you scramble it around, it says what? Elul. They fought for Elul. However, every single, every single year, the... Esav's angel, who's the evil inclination, fights with Yaakov's progeny, Yaakov's seed, his children, to take from him the month of Elul that Yaakov took from Esav. He wants it back. And Akadosh Baruch Hu tells us, as it says in the Pasuk, and should, uh, uh, you should uh, capture in captivity. Meaning what? Remember it says, He says, when you take the evil inclination, you go to war. He says, capture him and take the uh, take uh, take capture him in captivity and take the you know take from him the the loot or the what they call the what do you call it? Spoils. the spoils? What's the spoils of war? You're going to fight with the Yetzara and you're going to win him. I'm going to put him in your hand. But what's the spoils of war? that you can keep Elul. Elul is the reward. You fight with Yetzara, because he's coming back to claim what's his quote-unquote originally his. What's going to be the spoils of war? You get to keep Elul, the month that gives you the ability to atone for all 12 months. Why? Because it's Remez al Chodesh Elul, Shemazalo Betula, it's hinted that the month of Elul is the zodiac sign of the Virgo, She's the one that's being captivated by Esau. And you're going to war in order to who? To take out the Shat Yefetua. Take the month of Elul from the Yetzara. Because that's what he wants to do. Imre Noam, the book by Arab. Yoram Michael Abergel Zechit Sadiq Libracha says something very interesting. And now the, 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 the class is going to take like a small little right turn somewhere else, but we'll come back, okay? 
It says that when a person sins, when a person transgresses, when a person needs to get punished for certain uh, sins that he does, there are certain sins that a person receives lashes. There's many transgressions. That the punishment for the transgressions are lashes. As it says in this week's parasha, that the judge bends the, 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 the defendant over and he hits him. And he hits him as many lashes as necessary according to his transgression. Can you repeat that? Yes, what? There are sins. No, no, no. The, the, the pasuk. Yeah. So, so the pasuk first of all is in the twenty-fifth chapter, pasuk bet and pasuk gimel. If you want to look it up inside, twenty-fifth chapter, verse two and verse three, and it says over there, vehipilo hashofed veikau, that the judge uh, put him down and he hit him lefanav in front of him, kederi shato bemispar arbaim, and he hit him according to his. Uh, evil doings in the number how many lashes the maximum the maximum that he can hit, uh, a person amount of lashes that a person can receive is 40 lashes no more what's interesting is that it's never 40 in Masechet Makot on the 22nd page on the first side it says Kama Malkinoto when it comes to somebody that receives lashes, how much do you have to hit him? It says, Arba'im chaser echad. It's actually 40 minus 1, meaning 39 is actually the maximum lashes that a person can receive. Shneemar, bemispar arba'im. Because they are making a distinction that the wording is in the number 40. Minyan shu samuch arba'im. And they explain it that it, it's the number that is closest to 40. What's the closest number to 40? 39. So we have 39 lashes as the maximum amount of lashes that a transgressor can receive um, uh, when he sins from the Beddi. The Arizal chimes in on this 39. This, uh, this 39. And let's see what he says. Da. I want, so the Arizal says in his Sefer Likutim in Parashat Ordot, Da. You should know. When, uh, when Adam ate from the tree of knowledge, good and bad, something happened over there. When he ate from that tree, he caused it. To, he caused himself to be cursed by thirty-nine curses. Uh, uh, ten curses on him. Ten curses on Chava. Ten curses on the snake and nine curses on the earth. Like the way Veminyan Malkut, and if you add them all up, it's 39. Lamitet. And why would that be the exact number? Why would it be 39 curses in the first human being to ever be on the planet? Adam Arishon, because he sinned, he got 39 um, uh, curses. Keminyan Malkut. They are in the same equivalent number of the 39 lashes. And the reason for that is because his sin caused a nullification of the tal. The word tal means do, but it has a numerical value of 39. Tet is 9, lamed is 30. He nullified the 39 illuminations that he had available to him. And these 39 illuminations, light, spiritual sparks, whatever you want to call them, he lost them. They went back to the heavens and the negative spiritual husk that was empowered at that moment took those lights and took, um, and, and took it and started to prosecute in the heavens. And now not only is it prosecuting in the heavens, but it goes down and it becomes a prosecuting agent below as well. The Ari con con continues to explain that the root of these 39 lashes is from the original sin of Adam Arishon. So this whole thing that we have, a bed deen, a court that gives out 
punishment of 39 lashes, its source for that was Adam Rishon's first sin, that he lost the 39 lights. As, and there's a pasuk that backs it up, that says, Ki tal orot talecha, because the 39 orot, light, illumination, spirit, spiritual sparks, talecha, they belong to you. And because of that, because he sinned, he actually reversed these 39 blessings, 39 sparks, 39 points of light into 39 curses. Like we said, 10 to him, 10 to Chava, 10 to the snake, and 9 curses to the land. Now. Is connected somehow to the Tudanan Malachot on Shabbat? Yes. There's actually here a whole section of how it's connected to Shabbat. I skipped it mm -hmm. because I took it in a different direction. But if you want to share it, I can share it with you at the end of the class. Mm -hmm. But absolutely. Nice. Picked it up nicely. Okay, now, the minute I hear the word curses, I stop and I start to think, where else did we see curses? So, just a few weeks ago, in Parashat Re'eh, if you recall, the opening line to that parasha was what? Very good. Very good. Re'e, look, see. Anochi noten ifnechem hayom. I'm presenting in front of you today. Beracha uklala. Moshe Rabbeinu says, I'm presenting in front of you a blessing and a curse. Now, I'm going to read a few more Pesukim just so we can understand. What's the mechanism of blessings and what's the mechanisms of a curse? How does it work? So, the next two Pesukim, spell it out for us. It's, it's in the book. It's right after. Eta beracha. How do you activate blessings? Asher tishmeu mitzvot Hashem elokechem. When you listen to, when you heed to the word of God, you, you perform the mitzvot, the that Hashem commanded you. Hashem no chimet zavet chem ayom. That I'm commanding you today. That when you heed to the word of God, when you perform mitzvot, you are activating the formula to being blessed. Et abiracha. The reverse, a complete contrast. Vakel ala and the curse. Im lo tishno mitzvot Hashem lo kechem. When you don't listen to God's word, when you don't follow the mitzvot, when you don't perform mitzvot. Vesartem in adech, and you straight from the from the from the straight path of a kadosh baruch hu, Hashem nochim etzavet etchem ayom, that I'm commanding you today. La lechet achel, nochim achirim to follow other gods, Hashem lo yedatem that you're not even familiar with. So very simply put, this is called the law of attraction. I, I always repeat it whenever I say the law of attraction because everybody famously knows it from Oprah's documentary called The Secret. A few years ago, she made bank. She made a tremendous amount of money because she put a, a whole documentary together that the universe works by the law of attraction. If you're negative, you attract negativity. If you're positive, you attract positivity. Uh, you want a bicycle? Think about a bicycle. Draw a bicycle. Right, I want a bicycle. Look at a bicycle. Shop around for a bicycle. Eventually, you know what you'll get? A bicycle. And she did said that even for the lotto and even for a soulmate and all that, the law of attraction. And of course, for negative things as well. Thank you, Oprah. 3,335 years later, we already have nothing new under the sun, right? So here it is. How does it work? It's the law of attraction. You want blessings in your life? Perform it to give it to you. 613 magnets to blessings. Right? What's the complete opposite? Hashem is not one that's like a like this little angry God that just wants to curse people. When a person is not able to draw a blessing into his life, the the plan B of not being blessed is you know you, you can see people when they don't feel blessings in their life, what do they say? I'm not lucky, nothing goes my way. Huh? Complaining co complaining, oh why is this happening to me? And eventually they'll they'll get to the point they say, I think I'm cursed. Right? Because why? They're not magnets to blessings. What, what are they doing? The complete opposite. When you're not performing mitzvot, the default setting is you're attracting negativity into your life. That's what it is. That's how it works. It's either you're drawing positivity into your life, good things and blessings, 
or the complete opposite when you're not connected to a Torah life. Simply put, so if you're performing Torah, mitzvot, masim, tovim, if you're learning Torah, if you're performing mitzvot, if you're doing acts of kindness, you're going to attract blessings into your life. By lo tishmeu, if you don't follow the 613 ways of the Torah, it has a default setting, which is called a kelala, a curse. So, once again, when I hear that word kelala, you know, people get so scared, right? And I was... And I remember that it's so interesting. We're in the Teshuvah season, and right, you know, one of the one of the best tips that I can give anybody who's who's really like plugged in and wants to really yield a good good Teshuvah season, and actually wants to go to shul and be like super excited about praying during the holiday season, you know, it's a good tip. Take the book of the high holiday season and flip through it during Elul. You know, sometimes when you open up the book to Rosh Hashanah on Rosh Hashanah, or you open up the book of Yom Kippur on Yom Kippur, it's like, it's so hard to extract what you really need from it. Because you know what? That's it. The, the Hazan is off. You better follow. If you know, if you don't know, and you might find something that's very interesting and you read them before you know they're like 30 pages past you. Right? So what happens there? There you go. You, you're missing out. However, if you take your prayer book before, before the high holidays and flip through it, you won't believe the treasure, the treasure cove that you have over here of, of things that help you with the teshuvah, the words, the lyrics, it's unbelievable. So, the opening prayer, the opening prayer of Rosh Hashanah, Yom Adin, Judgment Day, Arvit, we sit down, there's a, there's a, a, a pizmon, there's a, a song that we sing, the Sephardim and the Ashkenazim. It's called Achot Ketana, Little Sister. Ah, I'll do the Moroccan, the version of it. And uh, I mean, I don't know how you're going to hear it, but you know, it's Achot Ketana, Ovecha veona teilotea Ena repana le machalotea Tifleshana vekilotea We do it about ten times. And basically what it is, is the stanza is lyrics that are incredible. I'm going to fill you in in a second. But the chorus, the, the one line, is Tifleshana vekilotea let the year end and it's curses. Ooh, juicy. Curses. That's what we're dealing with tonight. I want to understand why. Why is it that on Judgment Day, I'm ready to pray to God and the first thing that I'm talking about, let the year end and it's curses. Hold on. There's curses? You mean last year there were curses? And not only that, why we let, and over here we're like, let this year end and its curses get me out of here, right? It's very interesting. The last stanza, the last one, is <laughs> Let the year begin with its blessings. Beautiful song. Beautiful. But, why are we singing it? Well, take a look. If you take a closer look about the first tefillah that we do on Rosh Hashanah, it says, let the year, let the, uh, the year end with all its curses. So if you look at the words, I'm not going to go into all into it, but I'm just going to give you like cherry pick some, some of the good ones. El Narefana, please Hashem, heal the, the, the year. Lema Chaloteha, and all the sicknesses that happened in the past year. You know, before, you know, actually, before I go into the lyrics, we just learned that there's a berakha and a klala. You said berakha is when you choose the right path, when you're choosing a Torah lifestyle, when you're choosing to do the mitzvot, Torah, mitzvot, ma'asim, tovim. When you don't make those decisions, it automatically becomes the klala. What's a klala? It's a bad decision. You had a choice. You, took, you made the wrong choice. So we're saying, let the year end with all its bad decisions that we made. That everything in my, our lives could have been a blessing. 
And in, and in turn, it turned out to be a quote unquote curse. No, but I'll, I'll crystallize what you're saying. The Samech Mem, right? Why is it called a Samech Mem? Huh? <laughs> Very good. What is that? Social Samech Mem is the shit about social media, right? <coughs> that's, uh, that's, uh, I'm going to recycle that joke till I can't no more. But why is the Samech Mem called the Samech Mem? Because he who is Et adam. What's mesameh? Mesameh means to blind, right? When you a mesameh man is to blind. He's also called a chamsan. What's a chamsan? He says that he's so good that he gives you ninety-five percent truth, but the chamsan, the five percent that he gives you, that five percent that is shaken, crumbles all of that. So he blinds a person because when a person who looks at something that's ninety-five percent true, what do you say? It's true. If you don't keep digging to see the way, there's this five percent that breaks this whole thing down. He's fooling you. So the point that she was making that he has this quality, this uh, this talent to blind the people to not see the bad. Yes, that's who he is. As uh, that's his role. That's what he's supposed to be doing. He's supposed to challenge us, but we're supposed to be smarter than him. And Hashem gives us the ability to be smarter. Hashem gives us a lot of days where we have an advantage over them, like Elul. We're stronger than him in Elul. Right, but what do you have to do? You have to get up and fight. If you're sitting on the couch, you're not going to win that war because he was at the gym all night. <laughs> he's been working out. Right, you wake up in the morning, he's all pumped, he's ready to go. If you're like, you know, on the couch, no, no, no teshuvah today. You know, it's a third day of Elul, and he's still thinking whether, you know, I'll do teshuvah. I don't know, maybe ten days before, five days before the day of. You know, it's not going to work out for you. So what do we have over here? We have the Yisra that is challenging us. But nevertheless, we're talking about the year. That is the year that has Tich Leshana Vekilotea. Let the year end with all its curses. What does that really mean? Let the year end with all the bad choices that we made. Let the year end with the fact that we were magnets to bad decisions and it attracted quote unquote curse. Curse is such a heavy word. La la, you feel like, ah, like a witch, a witch is cursing you, right? It's not that. It's just that you made a, a wrong decision and it's, it's bothering your life right now. You have difficulty in health. You have difficulty in finances. You have difficulty in Shalom Bayek. You definitely don't want that in your life. You want that out. You could have attracted a different reality. You could have manifested a different reality. How? You should have made a Torah decision. You should have lived a Torah lifestyle, made Torah decisions in your life, and you would have attracted blessings into your life. But because you didn't do it, a person is now uh, uh, suffering from a year that had curses or the opposite of blessings let's say so let's say for example what is this song talking about so like i said it says hashem cured cured this year with all the people that attracted sicknesses then it says i go to okay where is that one So it says over here that strangers ate portions of its land. That now we're talking about like what's the curse? Shezarim achlu nachaloteha. What does it mean, zarim achlu nachaloteha? So imagine that we have people that are not living in Israel. I'm sorry, that are living in Israel, and it shouldn't be their 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 place, and they're eating portions of the land. Stop right here. You want to do current events? Gaza. What's the whole thing with Gaza? The whole thing with Gaza is that what? They're fighting for the land. It's ours. It's ours. We want this part. We want half of Jerusalem is ours. Gaza is ours. Parts of Yaakov. What do they want? They want sections. Zarim. Strangers are eating the land. How, how about the Bedouins? Did you hear about the Bedouin problem in Israel? So I'm originally from the Negev. I was born in Dimona. Dimona is in between... Uh, 
I would say yeah, what uh, uh, Yamamela, you know, like Sdom and uh, Beersheba, somewhere in the middle, small little town. They have like one traffic light. It's like uh, you go over there, and in between Beersheba and Dimona, they have over there settlements of Bedouins, illegal settlements of Bedouins. When I used to go, there used to be black tents and a couple of camels parked outside, mm -hmm. and they were like real random spotted. Really that was it when I was a child. I went back a few years ago. I remember when I went to, uh, I went a few years ago for Israel for whatever the reason was, and I passed by brick homes, solar panels, electricity, roads, all built illegally. And you it, can't go there. Huh? And you can't go there. Zarim ochlim la How did we get this curse? Because collectively we didn't do what we're supposed to do. So Hashem creates people for us to make us feel uncomfortable in our own land. Give you one other one. It says Ve'ed Sonecha. It says Hashem, please come and and and, and shepherd your your flock. Arayot Zaru, Ushfocha Unecha Borim Aru. It says, we're a small nation against the lions. All the lions. We're a small little lamb against the lions. They left nothing of your nation. The only thing that's left, they left what? Mere babies. There's 9 billion in the world. How many of our Jews? 14 million. What's left of God's children? Should you think that the, you know, the, the, the chosen nation should have, I don't know, a billion? Billion? I don't know. Out of out of nine billion that's in the world, how about a hundred million? Dare I dream? A hundred million? Okay, like ten percent, let's say, or whatever. We're, we're we're less than half percent. Left us nothing. Furthermore, even the, so, when we see over here is that we start the year the the the, the singing of we start the singing of Rosh Hashanah saying what. Hashem, there's an option for Kelala and an option for Beracha. Whatever bad decisions we made, please let it go. Don't let it overlap to the upcoming year. Snip, cut it here. Whatever was part of this year, snip it. Let's see, let the let the curses stay behind with this year. We got to the last day of the year. We survived. Thank God we're still alive. And the last line is, Shana, let the year begin with being positive, optimistic. I know what not to do. I learned this year. I did Teshuvah. I did the month of Elul. I have a list. I have a full list of what I did wrong. I know what I did wrong. And I know what the, the, the Teshuvah formula. We know we're not hiding our sins. We spelled out our sins. We did we do it. Forty days we're banging on our chest. We want to I know what the problem was. I'm going to leave. Let the year end and all its bad decisions. I already made the Shavanda. Let's build on the good. Let's go to the positive column of our of our Teshuvashi and we're gonna build on that. Let me build on the good. Let's go back to the Arizal. Remember, the original curse, Adam Arishon, he had these 39 orot, he lost it. They turned into 39 kelalot, 39 curses. Those 39 curses translated later on to 39 lashes. Later on they turned out to Lametet Melachot of Shabbat. But what is that connected to me today? Great story, thank you. I'm gonna go outside this door and I'll be able to repeat it. Give me something that I can walk out with. Something that I can... Okay, what does this 39 mean to me today? A little bit more history and then the practical lesson. Because the Arizal, he gives us the, the formula of how we rectify it. And once you know how to fix one thing, you can copy-paste, copy-paste, copy-paste. Once they show us how they did it in the past, we can do it in the present. So the Arizal reveals to us how... We were able to rectify the 39 curses of Adam Rishon. How we were able to rectify the sin of Adam Rishon. 
He says, "Hatikun lechorban haolam." This, this, the, the, the rectification for because there was a, a deterioration of the generations from Adam Arishon. It just went downhill. It went downhill. That Hashem did what? Hashem destroyed the world. When we got to Noah, he says, "I can't do it anymore. That's it. I'm pressing reset on the world." The Mabul came and he saved one family. And after he saved this one family, it continued to deteriorate. We had over there Dora Palagal, where they wanted to build the, the you know, the the, uh, the Tower of Babylon. That they wanted to go up to the Shemaim and and fight with the Kadosh Baruch Hu. Like everybody was either worshiping idolatry or wanting to fight a Kadosh Baruch Hu. You know, if you could imagine, like a, it's like it's like a, a father that just has children. Nobody listens to the father. Nobody. And because and and this thirty nine curses just become stronger and stronger and stronger. The world just became a, a terrible place to be in until. Abraham Avinu. It says, "Hatikun lechorban haolam of Adam Arishon itchil al yedei avotenu akedushim Avraham Yitzchak v'nigmar b'shlemut al yedei Yaakov Avinu." The process began with Abraham and Yitzchak, and Yaakov was able to do a complete rectification over the three cardinal sins, the three major harsh sins that Adam Arishon did. What were the three sins that he did from Eid? Uh, um, that Adam Arishon did on the first day that he was alive, he did Avodah Zarah, he worshipped idolatry, Gilur Arayot, he had improper relations, Vishfichut Damim, and he murdered. I don't know, I don't remember the story like that. Do you remember the story like that? He just ate. He just ate, Hashem was upset at it, and he kicked him out of uh, the Garden of Eden. Right? Where, when did he perform these three mega sins? Gilur uh, Avodah Zarah, Gilui Arayot and Shfichut Damim. And those are the three, the, these are the three sins that a person has to die for and not transgress on them. Who was alive the, besides him and, him and Chava? Say it again? Who was alive besides him and Chava? At that moment? Yeah. Animals? Yeah. Just the animals, there was nobody besides them. So let's start. How, ha, how did Adam Arishon transgress on these three major Avirot? Adam Arishon had divrei kfirah shalanachash. Hold on. Adam Arishon kibel a divrei kfirah shalanachash. Adam Arishon accepted the heresy of the snake when the snake told him, "Min ha'etz hazeh achal hamakom uvarat haolam." He says, "You know what's the dialogue that the snake had with Adam Arishon?" He tells him, "You see this tree over here." You know why God doesn't want you to eat it? Because he ate from it first. And he ate from this tree and he got the knowledge on how to create this world. And if you're going to eat from it also, you'll be able to create worlds just like him. That's what he told them. Midrash Tehilim says, this is why he was uh, tagged with the head of Abu Zarah. Why? Because he believed in an alternate reality other than the Kadosh Baruch Hu. And the second sin that he did, which is the Gilu Arayot, improper relations, what was it? He had relations with Chava during the day, and he didn't wait for the night time. Because we know that Israel Kedoshim Hen, Vehem Yishamshim Mitotehem Bayom. Masachet Ketubot says the proper time is only at night. And Adam Arishon, the first time that he had relations with his wife, was during the day. And not only that, Masechet Ketubot says on the 62nd page on the second side that the best time for a Talmid for a, for a, for a Chacham or a Tzaddik, and you should know that Adam Arishon was righteous, he was the handiwork of a Kadosh Baruch Hu. he should have waited just like all the Talmid Chachamim to do it actually when? On Friday evening, late at night. He did it during the day. So that was Gilu Arayot. Also, he did it in public. He, wasn't, he didn't do it modestly. And because of that, he sinned of Chet Gilu Arayot. Furthermore, because of that, so now the last thing that's left over, Shfichut Dami, murder. Has murder happening through the sin? Because that sin caused death to come into the world for him and for all the generations to come after him. And that's what Shri Damim. So there it is. 
he did do Avodah Zarah by listening to the snake in Ar Kadosh Baruch Hu. He did do Gilu Arayot. He had improper relations at the wrong time uh, with his wife. And he did murder because not only did he kill himself by bringing death upon himself, but death came into the world and all the people after him are need to die because of his sin. Interesting. So how do you rectify these three sins? Comes Abraham, comes Yitzhak, and comes Yaakov. Each one picks one and rectifies it. Abraham Avinu fought with all his power of the Avodah Zarah. He was the first one to promote uh, monotheism, mono, mono right? So what does it mean? He's the one to say, hey, you're bowing down to statues, you're bowing down to, uh, uh, you know, to something that's made out of wood or out of stone. There's only one God, and he goes and he promotes a Kadosh Baruch Hu all over the world. And he taught all the people that there is only one God that created the world. And only in Him you should believe. And by doing that, he rectified the first sin of Adam Rishon, of Avodah Zarah. By Abraham going to promote God as the only God in this world, that was the rectification for listening to the snake. It's Avinu that stretched out his neck when he was on the altar and he was ready to have his own blood spilled in order to perform the mitzvah that Kadosh Baruch Hu gave to his father because he was ready to die for Kadosh Baruch Hu that rectified for Shfichut Damim Shul Adam Arishon that he brought death into the world Yitzhak was ready to die for Kadosh Baruch Hu that rectified for the sin of Adam Arishon that brought death into this world Yaakov Avinu what did he rectify? So we know the only thing that's left over here now is Gilui Arayot. Because we rectified Avodah Zarah, we rectified Shfichu Damim, comes Yaakov Avinu and says that he protected his holiness in a way unlike anybody else. Vaita mitato shlema lelo kol pgam. When he passed away, he was sinless. Tikenet chit het Gilui Arayot shel Adam Yishon. He was able to rectify the sin of improper relations of Adam Yishon. And he had, and, and he was the one that completed the final rectification of the sin of Adam Yishon. That's why he was, since he completed the job, he was able to receive that thirty-nine. I'm sorry. He was able to reverse the thirty-nine curses that Adam Yishon brought into this world and bring back thirty-nine berachot. He was able to bring down thirty-nine blessings. Just like Yitzhak blessed him in his blessing. What is the blessing that Yitzhak gave his son Yaakov? Vayiten lecha elokim mital hashamayim. And Hashem should give you from tal. Tal is what? 39. Hashamayim. The 39 blessings that were taken away from Adam Arishon and got turned into curses. You were able to rectify the final thing from the sin of Adam Arishon. You are going to be able to get... Tal HaShamayim, the 39 blessings from the heavens. The Ben Ishchai But before I go to the Ben Ishchai So, happy ending, right? Yaakov fixed the sin, right? That's it. There's no more 39 curses, right? There's no more women having to give birth with, uh, you know, with uh, birth pangs. The parnasa is easy, right? is no longer there, right? They should have rectified it. Those 39 curses should be nullified. The answer is yes. They were nullified. And, they were, and the Yetzirah, the evil inclination himself, was completely nullified as well in the time of Matan Torah. But we know that 40 days later, when he was able to trick the Jewish people with the sin of the golden calf, everything came back. So we had a short period of time where we were able to fix, and we didn't have to deal with the evil inclination fighting us any longer. But he came back and he tricked us, and what did he do? He brought back the Talmud Kuyot. So he says, even though that the Jewish people sinned with the golden calf, it woke up the original prosecution of the 39 kilalot in Koman. 
So because it brought it back to the 39 kilalot, this is why it brought back also 39 lashes. It's a, it's a derivative of those 39 curses. And now, since that moment, since that moment of the golden calf, up until Mashiach comes, what's our role? What do we have to do? To nullify these 39 curses, to nullify these 39 lashes, 39 punishments, and in order to bring into the world the 39 blessings. So, they left us a huge job, right? Not a tiny job, a huge job. What? Our job is to nullify the kilalot, to nullify the lashes, meaning the curses that come every year, we have to nullify them, we have to work, to, that they don't happen. And even the lashes, you know, the small little things that bother us throughout the year, we have to nullify it. How do we do it? Okay, I have work to do, what do I do? It says you have to bring back, you have to draw, lab la'olam, to draw into the world, the 39 berachot. Okay. Can somebody tell me how we can bring 39 blessings instead of 39 curses into the world? Shua. Shua. Shua? Good answer. <clears throat> so the Ben Ishchai reveals to us three ways to nullify 39 curses and to bring 39 blessings. The Ben Ishchai says, which by the way, his yurt site is on the 13th of Elul. It's around the corner. He says that yes, in the original sin of Adam Yishon, we had 39 curses. Israel and the Jewish people, al tikun shosim b'shalosh pamim ahava. He says the Jewish people, when they're able to rectify three times with love, what is three times with love? So he says, he says when they do things with love, their thinking with love, their speech with love, and their action with love, it constitutes the number 13. No, I'm sorry, 39. How do we know that? What's the numerical value of the word ahava, love? No. Ah, Let's do it together. <laughs> Aleph, Aleph is one. Hey is five. That's six. Bet and si is two. That's eight. And the last one is Hey is five. Eight plus five? Thirteen. By the way, you, I, you know, back in the days, there was a reggae song. One love, one love, one love. Anybody know? Just me? Okay. One love. The word one is a had. And love is ahava. What's one love? Watch, even the reggae song has it. Echad is aleph is one, chet is eight, dalet is four. One plus uh, eight is nine. Nine plus four, 13. The word echad is 13. The word ahava is also 13. What's 13 plus 13? 26. Yud Vavke is one love. And the number of our house and broken. One, five, two, five. Exactly, Ahava. Oh, you gave up, okay. No, one, five, no, two. No, no, Ahava. Ahava. So now... I was thinking also, one of the things that you were saying, left, which is heart, is 32, plus 7, which is a very famous number in, in, in the Jewish religion. It's 39. Yeah. Very good. So the Ben Ishchai says, when you do, machshava dibur maaseh, thought, speech, and action with Ahava, it counts ahava, 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 13, 13, 13, total 39. You're able to nullify the 39 curses and activate 39 blessings. Wow. But what does it mean? What does that mean? Again, it's like I, I love that they give the formula, but I need details. I need details. If I don't get details, I don't know what to do. So he says, he says, ahava, that's written in our parasha, it says, There it is. That's the pasuk that teaches us that we have to love God with all our hearts, with all our soul. So it says, uh, what is meodecha? It says first, 
He says that you have to uh, love God with both your inclinations, the Yetzirah Tov and Yetzirah, both inclinations, good, uh, evil inclination and a good inclination. In your soul and with your money. That's three times Ava. And they are the ones that Mehaprim Lametet Shulashon Ayelets Ruftal. He said, You turn the Lametet Kelalot, you turn the Lametet, the 39 curses, into the word Tal, where Tal is a word of Beracha. So the formula is to worship Hashem with love, with both your inclinations, with all your soul, and with Mamon, and with your money. Meaning what? You know, some people really love money. Not only that, people get very attached to money. You know why? They work very hard for it. They work very, very hard for it. And, and you know, money is what gives a person the ability to do things in this world, right? To pay for a home, to pay for food, to go and pay for clothes, take care of the family, maybe fancy things, maybe vacation, whatever it is. So when somebody has to dip into their pocket on a Friday, $300, $500, $600 just for the shopping for Shabbat, what are you doing? You're showing Hashem, I love you. And I love your special day of Shabbat. And I know that I'm supposed to eat the best food and wear the best clothes and have the best time. There's no limit. Bechol me'odecha, with all my money. Oh, Chagim is coming? Great. How many feasts? 18 feasts? You got it. How much money is that? 7,000 in 18 days, 21 days. With love. Behava, <laughs> not a problem. Or when you, you know, we're instructed to get uh, where talit and tefillin. Do you, okay, do I get the do I get the three hundred dollar pair of tefillin, or can I go and get a little bit better? Can I get the five hundred, or do I have the ability to get the best of the best of the best and spend like two thousand or twenty five hundred dollars for it? Is it possible? When a person dips into his pocket and shows the love for the Torah, the loves of the mitzvot, in order to honor, it's a way of honoring Hashem. When a person goes all out with his money. It says that's another way of showing love towards the Kadosh Baruch Hu. And this love, this approach of, of having a, a loving relationship with Kadosh Baruch Hu nullifies curses, activates blessings. So, uh, and why you say levavecha? Why does it just say live? Why you say one heart? We don't, have to live we don't have two hearts. But we know that on the, on the heart, there's two. There's Yetzirah Tov and Yetzirah. So levavecha. So worship Hashem with Yetzirah Tov and You know, you just have to know how to manage the evil inclination. The evil inclination, he's just an angel that's doing his job properly. You know, sometimes it's easy to make him as the enemy and like a villain and just hate him and be against him. Or you could take a look at him as just a personal uh, life coach, right? It's like a coach that whatever he tells you, you just do the opposite. Isn't that great? It's like, you know, guaranteed, whatever he tells me is wrong. Okay, do the other thing. Is there anything better? It's like he gives you perfect instruction of what not to do. Okay? Thank you. It's like a, a personal trainer. Uh, and the other thing is, so, with Shnei Tzarecha, and then Banefesh Ube Mamon, which you sold him with your money. Now, it says, when a person does this, he merits to love a Kadosh Baruch Hu in three different ways of Ahava. Ahava Sheba Maaseh, Ahava Sheba Dibur, and Ahava Sheba Machshava. You love Hashem with your thought, with your speech, and with your action. Now, the Ben Chai says that when you are doing these three uh, the thought, speech, and action out of love, you rectify the curses and you draw the blessings into your life. However, Baal Shem Tov HaKadosh says something unbelievable about these three loves. He says that Baal Shem Tov HaKadosh, he actually uh, instituted that all the learnings of the Baal Shem Tov are based on, these, on the principle of these three loves. What are the three loves? Meaning, Ben Ishchai says, Machshava, Dibur Maaseh. Thought, speech, action, that's the opinion of the Ben Ishchai. 
The Baal Shem Tov says completely different. He has three different things, three different loves. He says, you know how you nullify the curses? With these three loves. Which three loves? Ahavat Hashem, Ahavat Torah, Ahavat Yisrael. Love God, love the Jewish people, and love the Torah. And he brings sources, Ahavat Hashem, you have to love God, because it says, Ve'avtat Hashem Elokecha. Um, to love the Torah, there's a pasuk in Mishle, Ve'avata Tizge Tamid. And Ahavat Yisrael, loving the Jewish people, as it says, Ve'avta Echa Kamocha. So the Baal Shem Tov also is, 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 is Mekayim, the Pasuk in Kohelet, that says, Vechut HaMeshulash, Lo Bimhera Yinatek. That the, you know, you take a rope, right? Take a rope with one string. Typically you can snap it. If you take two pieces of string and put them together, they're much stronger, right? Take three strings together and tie them together, now you have a much stronger bond. It's gonna be much harder to uh, to rip it or to disconnect it. So that's what it says over here. He said that it's going to be very hard to disconnect this this uh, this uh, three-way interconnection, which is what? Kudusha Berichu Oraita Reisayel. HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the Torah and Israel is one. And he says, don't fool yourself for the one that loves God and loves the Torah but he can't stand another Jew. He says that what? He says, don't think that you can have two out of three. You have to have three out of three for these 39 curses to turn into 39 blessings. Okay. Side point. On Sunday, for anybody who has time during the day, Sunday morning at 10 o'clock, Rabbi Sael Abergel Shlita, uh, the son of Rabbi Yoram Michael Abergel, uh, Zechet Sadiq uh gives a Zoom class in Hebrew, and I merit to do the, the, the translation for that class. The rabbi in this week's class touched on this exact same point, and he gave such a master key to life that I have to repeat it because it's mamash what we're learning about. He said, Baal Atanya was, and, and it's as well brought by the Ariza, also brought in the book of Etzach Haim, says that every single person actually has two nefeshot living inside of them. There's two souls in front of them. One is nefesh elokit, one is nefesh behemit. One is a godly soul and one is a physical soul, meaning more of an animalistic soul. Right, one that is belongs to Yetzirah Tov, that's the spirit, the the, the spiritual one, the, the 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 godly uh, part of the soul, and then the Yetzirah, his part of the soul is the one that is the animalistic soul. So just imagine that inside of you there's two Yetzirah Tov, Yetzirah Elokit Behemit, and he says something very interesting that. Each one is pulling in a different direction. Yetzara wants you to give pleasure to the body. Uh, everything that has to do with the body, right? Uh, food, sleep, uh, the pleasures of this world, all the, all the desires that the person uh, would want to, uh, you know, want to indulge in. And then you have the godly soul who's just interested in what? Being spiritual, performing the Torah, and getting elevated to uh, to the highest level possible, uh, you know the Jews' uh, job in this world is to make shalom bayit between them, to make the the the, the, the physical the, the nefesh behemit the animalistic side of the body. We give it what it wants. We give it its food. We give it its uh, its uh, rest, its bodily pleasures. But we do it by ways of mitzvot, like we always said. We give it the food, but it comes with a blessing. We give it the money, but we earn it. Honestly, and we give tzedakot. Uh, it, you know, it wants to procreate. It happens after marriage. Everything that they want, he's going to get. The, the, the animalistic soul is going to get it. But it has to be through what? Through holiness. But at, uh, at a default setting, when a person is not doing anything, each side is pulling one way. One side of the soul is going to push you to go to the Bet Midrash, go to the shul, go pray, go learn. The other one is like, let's go to the baseball game and eat a hot dog, right? 
two things are pulling you in two different directions. And the nefesh says has three different libushim. The nefesh expresses itself in three different ways, which is what machshava, dibu, vemase, which we just talk, talked about it. That the human being has three uh, three levels of expression: thought, speech, and action. Just to give a, a, a quick example of that, and I'll use the example of Rabbi Isaiah Abuja. He says a person might want to build a building, so he thinks in his mind, "Oh, beautiful building, 52 floors, uh, blue uh, uh, blue um, uh, uh, glass uh, doors, and uh, and maybe some balconies and uh, and an elevator." It's it's just b'machshava, right? In order for it to become a reality, he has to go know to an engineer, dibu. He has to tell him his vision, and the engineer has to put the plans, 3D, architecture, all that. And then the third part is the maase, where they actually, the, you know, the builders come and they take the plans and they build it out and it becomes a real building. Machshava dibu and maase. Now, us, give you another example, imagine us as this like super luxurious car, right? Like uh, the best car that could be out there, super fancy car with all the bells and whistles. And this car has two keys, right? But it can only have one driver. Meaning either the Yetzer HaTov is going to drive that vehicle or Yetzer Hara is going to drive that vehicle. So let's just say, the, you know, you're making all the right tour decisions. Yetzer HaTov is in the, he's driving, he's in control. But at one point he stops, he says, I need to get something. He steps outside. They, now it's vacant, right? Who's driving the car? There's nobody here. Yetzer HaTov left. Who knows what he's doing, right? The Yetzer says, don't worry, I got a key too. I know how to drive this. Thing. He jumps in and he takes over. There can only be one driving, right? Either the Yetzer HaTov takes over or either Yetzer HaTov takes over. You, it all depends on who you allow to drive. What do you mean, how, how, do, how you allow to drive? I have control? Absolutely. The rabbi was saying that a person is in the danger zone when the Yetzirah is driving because he's making all the wrong decisions. In order for the Yetzirah Tov to be driving, quote-unquote, you, to be managing this vessel that your Neshama, you have to be constantly in the state of Kedusha. And how do you stay in a, in a constant state of Kedusha? He said, it starts with Mahshava, Dibu, and Maaseh. He says, but the number one thing, in the, the first thing, the first thing that a person has to do is machshava, positive thinking. When you have a positive outlook on life, you're at a much better place of, number one, be, becoming holier. Number two, having a better experience in this world and the law of attraction, attracting all the be'achot to you. He said that this, this positive thinking, this positive outlook, the machshava, leads to positive speech, loving, caring, verbal interaction, which later on goes to Maaseh, turns into a good positive reality, a good uh, mitzvah, a good, uh, a good deed. What's the complete opposite of that? That's Yetzirah Tov driving. What happens when Yetzirah Hara is driving? That's a negative mindset. That's the negative outlook. And you know, that's uh, unfortunately, a lot of people in this world are negative, are negative. They are big time complainers. They only see the bad. They only see fear. They only see negativity. You know, they're very judgmental, very condescending. It's a very, very dangerous trait. And this negative outlook yields harm and damages people. What do we say? They become a magnet to the kilalot. How do you get there? How do you get the different Rosh Hashanah? Please let these curses end. Because you're negative. You're negative. You think negative. You attract negative. You speak negative. Your actions are negative. Everything is damaging to you, to your husband, to your wife, to your children, to the people around you. You're like like a, a cloud of negativity. And what, what do you think is going to come? You're a magnet to everything that is bad, which is quote unquote the opposite of blessing, which is quote unquote the kelala. The most important, thing, the thing that that destroys marriages, destroys relationships, destroys businesses is a negative mindset, a negative outlook, a complainer. If you want to be holy, if you want to be a magnet to blessings, you have to work extremely hard on having a positive outlook, a positive mindset.
As a matter of fact, in order to draw blessings into your life, you have to learn how to be positive. That how to think, how to speak, how to act, how to live positive. It's not simple, especially if a person is negative from their, you know, God-given DNA, from the, from the DNA they got from their parents or from the environment or from their social conditioning or from the programming from social media that everybody likes to just point out everything that's negative in this world. Even the news, when you turn on the news, do they ever report anything good? Everything, is just, it's like your program negativity all day long. But if you live positive, you'll also uh, achieve spiritual heights. What I love about this lesson is that when you decide to be holy, I want to be kadosh, you picture a kohen gadol with the turban and bet HaMikdash and the animal sacrifice. No, no, no. You can be holy. You know what was being holy? Be positive. Be a positive thinker. Be a, think positive. Act positive. Uh, you know, machshavot tovot, diburim tovim. There's a very famous song. It's a very good song, by the way, if you know it. Shavuot Whatever. Letting you know that being holy is as easy as being positive. Or is as hard. And if it's hard, that's your tikkun. That's what you're here for. Stop being a negative nelly and start being positive. You're polluting the environment with your attitude or with your outlook. It's not good. And, uh, and whether you like it or not, it affects people. You know, misery loves company. There's some people that the minute somebody's negative, oh my God, stay close to me, here we go. I got somebody to complain and the shon hara and all that. It's work being positive. And if you don't know that, if you're not living that, uh, then how are you going to attract the blessings? Every single Rosh Hashanah, you're going to be like, oh, like Groundhog's Ear. Groundhog's Day, Groundhog's Day. Every time complaining about the curses of the year. Don't you want to like be like, it was a good year. Thank you, Hashem. That was a good year. When's the last time you said to Hashem, wow, that was a good year. That was unbelievable. I look back, it's good. It was a good year. I, 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 I attracted blessings into my life. Wow, I'm doing something right. I'm on the right frequency. I'm on the right channel. Does it always have to be like something negative? Oh, I'm missing this. I'm lacking that. Starts with a positive mindset. Negative thinking brings pain to the world. It brings marital strife. It's a bad moral example for children. And the whole world is suffering from a negative outlook. Hashiva yotzeret metziut. Your, your thoughts create a reality. Know that. Hashiva yotzeret metziut. Thoughts create reality. And kshapnimiyut chazak, akor chazak. When you're internally strong, everything is strong. Nothing can break you down. But you have to work on yourself. This next part, and with this I'll conclude, blew me away. And that's what I want to share it with you guys. I was absolutely in shock when the rabbi shared this with us. Because nobody talks about this, you know? Nobody talks about this. It says that negative thinking closes doors. Negative thinking closes opportunities. Negative thinking closes shari, uh, closes the, the, the gates. So you can say, okay, I get it. Uh, if a person is negative, then he closes his own gates. The chidush here is that you close other people's gates too. When you have a negative thought about somebody, you close their gate also. That's how powerful your thoughts are. That if you have a negative thought about somebody else, you're closing their gate. I'll give you a beautiful example. We know the Gemara speaks about Elia Kohen. If you remember, there was Hana. Remember, Hana was barren. She kept crying. She wants children. She wants children. She wants children. She was asking her husband, Elkanah, pray for me. He tells her, ah, why do you need children? I'm like 10 kids. What do you want? I'll go to Publix. What do you want to go to the movies? Whatever you want, I'll do for you. Right? She tells him, look at this guy. This guy, he doesn't understand my pain. He doesn't, he doesn't understand what I need. I need a baby. I want a child. So what did she do? She went to the Kohen, Elia Kohen. She tells the Elia Kohen, she goes to pray, and she was so into tefillah that from far away she was moving her lips. By the way, from her, we <coughs> learned that when we, we pray, we have to move our lips. We don't, we don't just look at the letters. You actually have to move your lips, even if you don't sound it out. You have to move your lips. From here, from her we learn. Elia Kohen comes and he had the breastplate. 
and you know the the lights started to go off that shows the letters, and he the letters that came up he read it as shikora, she's drunk. So he comes to her. He's like, "Aren't you embarrassed to come over here, be next to Beit Hamikdash, praying while you're drunk?" So he thought negatively about her, which means what? He closed her gate. She can't have children, because he closed her gate by thinking <coughs> negatively about her. What did she tell him? Hana tells him, "Why do you think negatively about me?" It doesn't say shikora. The letters of shikora also spell out two other words: keshera, I'm kosher. Or, Kesara, I'm like Sarah that was barren and now I want a child. You put your negativity on me. You closed my doors. Elia Kohen said, you're right. You know what he did? He right away went, he apologized to her for stopping all the shefa to come down into the world for her. He prayed for her. He had positive mindset about her. And he opened up the, 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 the abundance of heavens to come down into her. And she gave birth to Shmuel, hand-picked king from a Kadosh Baruch Hu, that he was equivalent, Shmuel is ke Moshe ve'aron. He was equivalent like Moshe and Aaron, this little child. Just to show you that even on other people, how you affect them. I mean, you know, a lot of people think, oh, this guy put Ayn Hara on me, oh, it's the evil eye, or the, this one over here, I don't like it. You're closing your own gates. You're closing your own gates by having negative mindset. In conclusion, when we come to the end of the year and we do introspect, right? We're supposed to look. The list. Remember the list? The negative column? That's Mepashpesh. What's wrong with me? What did I do this year? Where am I off? Right? And Hashem gives us 40 days to do that. 40 days. Because if you find something small, okay, I can fix that. Uh, something medium, okay, it's going to take me a few phone calls, a few emails, maybe a couple of lunches, I'm, I'm going to figure it out, right? But what if you find that big one that you can't take care of in one second? Remember, Esau wanted to give us one day. Hashem is, Yaakov says, no, they need 40 days. They need Elul and a sentiment to Shuvah. They, Yaakov fought for it. You're going to abandon it? You're going to let it go? You're going to say, Yaakov, thank you for the fight. Thank you for the, you know, thank you for the, for the MMA... Uh, event that was going on, uh, I don't know, 3,500 years ago, but I'm going to skip out on what you fought for. Are you kidding me? Thank you, Yaakov. Thank you for giving us this opportunity. You can't forfeit it. So we have to look and find, because if there's something big, you need a proper teshuvah. You need a proper teshuvah. You got to fix it. It's not so simple. You have to go down the whole list of people that you've interacted with the entire year, and then... You have to make good with Hashem. Because mm-hmm. Baruch Hu says, first my kids. Go, go make it right with my kids, then come to me. You can't make it right by Hashem without talking to His children. First you have to do right, Ben Adam Lechaviro, then Ben Adam Lechavirot. So there's work. So what were, and, and, and you know, just like, sort of like, mm-hmm. you know, if you put it on paper, you're like, okay, what was I a magnet to this year? Right? It's almost like you're auditing yourself. Was I a magnet to blessings or curses? Uh, you know things that were that there were that, that, that I, I register as something positive or a lot of negativity around me. What was I? What, what was? What was I drawing into my life? What was I manifesting into my life? You have to know that. You have to like. You have to know that for yourself. You have to be real with yourself. You can't let another year go and be like, okay, Hashem, forgive me and hope for the best. You have to understand where did I do wrong? Any, you know, sometimes the way we treat our businesses. Is we're so meticulous about not losing a penny on a product, right? Making make sure that we make every single dollar and every single penny because we're smart and shrewd businessmen. Do you treat your spirituality the same way? Are you medakdek on every little thing on how what you did? Because this is what it's all about. And when you do that, when you do that work, you start to find out that you know, will Hashem forgive me for this? Will Hashem forgive me for that? Well, am I able to? And of course, we, you know, I don't want to go off into another tangent, but go look at the beauty of what Teshuvah is. And you also become, you realize that you manifest your own reality. So what happens then is it becomes it a little bit uh, exciting, right? I can create my own life. I can draw whatever life I want, right? Whatever I want to be, I can be. How? Mahshava, Dibur, Maaseh. And first with positive thinking. 
Because a person that changes his positive outlook becomes a brand new individual. So whatever dinim are in the Shemaim, they no longer have an address. <laughs> Correct. Machshavot tovot, diburim tovim, maasim tovim. In short, you need to shed the old, build on the good, and then you can uh, come into Rosh Hashanah and, and and sing with all your heart. Tachel shana uvechotei. Hashem v'ayech nechem v'samech nechem. You should have a good teshuvah season, a shana tova. Ashana filled with blessings and you've got the formula activated. Thank you.